Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Juliette Beauchamp and I am here with CSO Online contributing writer Maria Korolov. AI and ML projects are really exciting, but it's important to not forget how important cybersecurity is. And there's some unique threats that come along with AI and ML projects. So that's why Maria and I are here today to discuss how you can ensure that your AI and ML projects are as secure as they possibly can be. So Maria, thank you so much for calling in and joining me today. So- Well, thank you for having me. So the, something important to remember is that in most cases, or in many cases, AI and ML projects are not developed or made by cybersecurity experts, right? Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, differences about AI and ML software development, is that it often starts out on the theoretical side with data scientists. And uh, they might have PhDs in analysis or algebra or statistics or whatever they come from, but they're not necessarily cybersecurity experts or, or even trained uh, developers. So they will come up with things that work. Um, and they may like skip steps like authentication or encryption. Um, uh, and other methods of making sure that the data and this processes are secure. And then they get a working model uh, put together and then they toss it over to the production side. And too often, a lot of those things that started out insecure stay insecure when they move into production. And so that's something to really watch out for. And, and one way to do that is to bring the data scientists into the DevOps um, you know, ch chain. So they work together with the engineers, the developers, the data architects, the cybersecurity professionals, uh, and everyone else who's part of that team from the very start of the project. At so often is the theme in security, and we've said it so many times, I know I have, and I'm sure you have as well, is the idea that security needs to be baked in from the start. So, of course, you want to involve data scientists in your planning stages, but making sure that you have cybersecurity experts in the room, too, is super important, right? Like, say, for example, um, you have training data. So, um, a data scientist might pull real data with real PII, use it in unencrypted form in their test platforms to develop the algorithm. But in order for this to be used in production, the training data has to be anonymized or tokenized or encrypted before it goes into the model. Um, you need to have access controls on it. Uh, all of these things slow down the model developing process. And it's not as convenient for the data scientists to create and play with the model as they're playing with it. Because you know all these extra steps take time and effort and attention. But if you don't do them up front, they might get skipped at the end. And, and with AI and ML projects, the consequences can be very dramatic. And that really brings us to a really important point and something that I'd really like to focus on in our discussion today, which is AI is handling just so, so much data. And of course, all of our viewers understand that, that between you know, the training data and the um, operational data, it's, it's a lot. And that's obviously gonna be a really appealing target potentially to hackers. So can you tell me what needs to be done to make sure that your data is protected from the beginning? Um, so yes, yeah, so AI and ML projects are super data hungry. They want lots of data. They want data in context. So they want third party data that they can correlate with that first party data. This is an incredibly value target rich opportunity for hackers. So if the, the systems aren't processed properly from the start, um, this data can be too easily accessible to the bad guys. So first of all, you keep the minimum amount of data that you need. And this is a very hard discipline for data scientists and ML uh, teams to do because they want to get as much data as they can. Um, you really want to have as little data as you can because too much data isn't just a security issue, it's a compliance issue. 
uh, some of that data is not relevant. Social security numbers typically don't help much with model development for most enterprise applications, but they're very dangerous to have on hand if you grab them up accidentally as part of your little data vacuum or you shoot put up all the data from everywhere you can. Um, if you do need to have that data, if you need, do need to have transactional, transactional data, bank account data, anything like that, tokenize it if you can, anonymize it, encrypt it. Uh, you, there's lots of things you can do with data to make it less valuable if a thief gets their handle on it. Uh, and another thing you can do lately in particular uh, for, to protect data is not just encrypted while in storage and while in transit, you can also protect it during runtime with something called confidential computing. IBM, Amazon, Microsoft, and uh, Amazon all offer secure enclaves of one flavor or another to isolate applications while they're running to protect the data that's in them. And this obviously applies to all applications, not just AI and ML projects. Um, but it's particularly relevant these days to AI and ML because, um, like I was saying, the data scientists might be skipping these steps. So any extra layers of security you can add to one of these applications can be very, very useful. Um, another um, type of attack that you can get with uh, specifically on AI data is something called an inversion attack. Um, and an expert that I talked to at Booz Allen, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton says that with an inversion attack, an attacker could uh, work with an AI or an ML application and extract from it, not just how the system works, but actual the raw training data, including PII. And this is an attack that's, that exists out there uh, it is possible to protect it, but right now protecting against that attack is very, very expensive. He estimates that it takes about 100 times as long to train a model in a way that protects the data against inversion attacks. So um, uh, again, that's something you want to build in at the beginning to protect your data from attackers. I think too, it's important to recognize that like you mentioned, it sometimes can be really, really expensive to make sure that you are employing, you know, in a perfect world, every single company and all data would be as protected as possible. But the reality of the situation is that's just not always possible. Maybe it's too expensive. It's, I don't know, perhaps sometimes too labor intensive, but I'm curious, like, how do you strike that balance or what are the trade-offs, I guess, between investing a ton of money in making sure that all of your data is protected from the beginning or doing that protective work on the back end once your AI systems are already up and running? So uh, a lot of times you wind up doing it in the back end because you don't have a choice. You know, it's, you can't go back in time. Um, <laughs> But if you already are at the beginning, you do a risk analysis. How much is it going to cost you to do the security? How much is your exposure if you don't do the security? How much will it slow you down? How much money will it cost? How much will it cost you in terms of lost opportunities? And you have to balance all these out. Uh, and with AI projects in particular, you have to be careful that you're not doing the risk analysis based on what the platform is doing right now, but what the platform will do once it scales up. If it proves to work, if the test projects go through well, if the pilots succeed, and then you expand it out like a hundredfold or a thousandfold or a millionfold, now your exposure is significantly different. So when you do your risk benefit calculation up front, you need to plan for your risk exposure down the line when it goes live, not your risk exposure right now, which can be uh, minimal. Uh, and again, you can do things to minimize your risk exposure, like reducing the personal data that's in a data set, um, adding levels of security, encryption, using confidential computing, get as much of the, of the data and, and processes out of scope uh, so you don't have to deal with 
potential data breaches or compliance situations. Um, and that will reduce your risk exposure without, without too much of a hit to the cost. Uh, just takes a little bit of more planning ahead of time. Before we move on, I'm intrigued a little, some bit about, about sort of this compliance issue. I mean, if you are training an AI or um, ML model on tons of personally identifiable information and all of that data is potentially, potentially accessible to an attacker, you could really be in breach of some data privacy laws. What do companies stand to lose besides you know, a, rep a huge reputation hit if their AI and ML models are not secure. Oh, don't get me started. First, there's the GDPR things, up to 4% of global annual revenues. Huge, huge impact. Then there's the CCPA, which went into effect this summer, which applies to uh, everyone who lives in California and everyone in California loves to sue. So uh, big, big uh, potential risk exposure there. And uh, although things have slowed down a little bit because, I mean, everything in the world has slowed down uh, right now, but eventually uh, everybody expects other states to follow suit similar to California, or we might eventually have a federal law about data protection and privacy. Uh, and uh, the other thing about the California law, which is particularly interesting, especially for AI data sets that come from multiple sources, is that uh, people can request to see where their data is going. So for the first time, people can see where their personal data travels from company to company to company. You don't want to be part of that chain unless you absolutely have to, unless you're providing a clear benefit to the customer. If the only benefit is to you personally, you might want to rethink your data strategy at that point. Um, and it is tempting because the more data you have, the more insights you can get. Uh, so that's more of a self-control issue really than a cybersecurity one. So now I'm sort of curious about what the future looks like. I think we already discussed a few types of threats, but I'm curious what security issues could um, be facing AI and ML in the future or even some right now. Could you touch on some of those? Yeah. So the the things we talked about before, building security into development chain, protecting data, those are pretty much common to all uh, IT projects. AI has a little bit of its own twist on it, but these are practices we know well. But there's new threats that are coming down the lines that are specific to AI and ML that can have big repercussions in terms of um, public reputation, security, compliance, and areas we haven't even thought of yet because they haven't been invented. <laughs> the one that's happening already right now is the issue of bias. Uh, so for example, if you train your HR system on who's the most likely candidate for a job based on prior history, you might exclude very talented women and minorities because your company hasn't hired them in the past. So that's a case of a biased data set leading to biased predictions. And that was very embarrassing. It happened recently to Amazon. Um, and to protect against bias in data sets, uh, it's a tricky issue that's under research and development right now. And there's systems that people are trying to create to test a data set for bias. And until then, there's best practices that people can follow to make sure that their data sets are representative um, and comply with best practices and guidelines. Um, for cybersecurity applications in particular, you don't wanna have bias built into the system because if you're biased, say a particular kind of malware, the minute the bad guys figure that out, all you're gonna see is that malware. So, and um, with cybersecurity systems, if you're using an external vendor to, to do your behavioral anomaly detection or malware detection or endpoint protection, you don't even know what training data they're using. You don't know what the built-in biases are and have very little control over how to guard against it. And that's something that you need to have this very strong conversation with your vendor about. 
how that is handled in their system, which is often a black box system. And that's a conversation that people haven't really been having a lot yet because it's all brand new and they really should be looking at it and forcing their vendors to develop systems to provide a view into the black box methodology. Vendors don't wanna do this. They don't wanna give up their secret sauce. But if you don't know why an AI is making a, a security recommendation that it is, it's gonna be hard for you to trust it. Um, it's gonna be hard for your employees to really adopt it at scale. And it's not gonna be as effective as it could be because it might be missing critical use cases that maybe are unique to your company because you don't know what's going into that model. So that's something that has both kind of public facing implications uh, of like public embarrassment because your model is biased against a group of people, uh, financial implications. If you're a bank, for example, and your model is biased against a particular kind of borrower and it has security implications. If your model is biased against, you know, certain kind of types of attacks, for example. So those are all things that are problems already, and we don't really have good, good tools to protect against them yet. So I'm curious too about model drift. I've heard that that is a threat that um, IT teams, cybersecurity professionals, and you know, AI and ML developers should be thinking about. Could you expand on what that is? So a model drift happens if your uh, training data is good, your model's good, you put it into production, and then things change. People's behaviors change, the malware changes, and the model is no longer particularly useful. Or um, the other can happen, your training data is always changing because you're using the latest data to train it. Um, and your model drifts, but the latest data may be uh, a spike, an unusual spike of something that happens and it permanently changes your model. And now your model is no good because the training data wasn't very curated. So you have to be careful about both of those things. And the bottom line there is that AI and ML systems aren't, you know, put it in, run and forget it. They're something that have to be continuously monitored and continuously measured to make sure that they're working. And the training data that's used to update these models has to be vetted to make sure that it's not uh, going wonky for one weird reason or another, that the training data continues to be up to date, that old irrelevant data is no longer used. If like, if you close your office in Cleveland, I mean, you just wanna get rid of all that training data altogether. Cause if somebody's still you know, dialing in from Cleveland, that's a problem. They're using obsolete access, they're a criminal. Whereas a month ago, it would have been totally normal. So these things happen all the time with companies, everything changes. Uh, and you have to make sure that the training data and the model reflects those ongoing changes. And that brings me to the question of poisoning, <laughs> which is a brand new kind of attack against AI systems. Now, the experts that I've talked to said that they're not seeing example of this in the wild yet because existing attack vectors are so successful for criminals that they don't need to like invent new, new ways just yet. Um, but as AI systems get more widespread, poisoning is gonna become a bigger issue. And you need to build in protections for that upfront because you don't wanna be dealing with it after the fact, all of a sudden when these AI systems are everywhere, people figure out how to poison them and you're getting widespread AI poisoning attacks. And poisoning is, um, uh, say you have a, an intruder alarm on your, on your house, and every time somebody steps on a lawn, it goes off. So a criminal who wants to break into your house at four o'clock in the morning might say, start walking their dog at four o'clock in the morning past your house, and the dog wanders onto your lawn, sets the, off the alarm, you look out the window, see the dog, turn it off. After it happens a few times, 
you're going to start ignoring that or, you know, maybe turn the whole thing off at three in the morning or, or somehow adjust your behavior. So you're not being woken up at four in the morning. And that's when the attacker hits. So it's the same thing can be done with AI systems. They will send you bad data. Uh, for example, they might send you examples of software or websites that are good websites, legitimate, that have malicious code in them that doesn't do any harm. And the users are like, no, this isn't malicious. This is perfectly good. It's not harmful. The AI system learns to ignore that code and then wham, you know, the, the attacker uses it as their attack vector. Um, you can do the, this kind of poisoning to uh, do financial attacks, to get money out of a company, to get approval, say for loans that you shouldn't have approval for. Um, if you, uh, if the attackers have access, actual access to your training data somehow, they might be able to inject that right into the process if they compromise the supply chain of the data. Uh, so that's another way that the poisoning can be done. And if the model learns from experience with users, um, that's what happened with Microsoft chatbot, Tay, which quickly became this racist, weird, crazy person due to interaction with weird, crazy, racist internet users. So you can have people manipulating an AI system into doing bad things. When you have an AI system that predicts, say, the weather, the weather isn't going to maliciously try to fake out the AI system. <laughs> but when an AI system is trying to predict hacker behavior, then yes, they will deliberately try to outwit the system. And if the system is in wide production use and they can get a copy of it to play with, mm -hmm. then you know, that's more likely that they will come up with a way to spoof it. And if it's in very wide production use, then they'll have a very wide attack surface to enjoy themselves with. So that's like, that's one of the things where I talked about, you talk to the vendor about how they're protecting these things. And if the vendor says, oh, nobody's doing that, that's not a real threat. Well, it might not be a real threat today. It's gonna be a real threat tomorrow. So build in the protections now while you can before, you know, your company goes out of business through some horrible high profile disaster and giant compliance fines. Yeah, of course. So Maria, before I let you go, could you just provide our viewers perhaps with a quick security checklist when it comes to AI and ML projects? Okay. So I got this uh, security checklist from Deloitte. Uh, and this is just basic general steps that companies should do when they're when they have AI projects. And the first step is to know what AI projects they're doing. Uh, ironically, well, actually not ironically, this is true for all kinds of projects. Most companies don't know what they're doing. Most companies do not have a full inventory of their AI and ML projects, uh, and of course, all the data and everything else that they need for those projects. And you, you, don't, you can't start protecting something if you don't know what you're protecting and, and where that stuff that you're protecting is living. Um, the next step is to um, align your AI risk management with broader risk management efforts. And I talked a little bit about this, measuring the, the risk rewards for AI projects. Um, it also helps if you have a single executive who's in charge of AI risks as opposed to having a bunch of people in different departments, all having a piece of it, and each one is, is expecting the other one to do it. So it doesn't get done. <laughs> um, conducting internal auditing and testing of AI projects. Uh, this is something that's often lacking in all software development projects, but it's, it's particularly important right now with AI and ML because these are all new technologies. You can't rely on everybody else having tested them and kind of like try to coast on their coattails because nobody else has tested them yet. These are brand new. So if this is something mission critical, if it involves a lot of risk for your company, do your own uh, testing, do your own auditing, auditing, especially if you're writing the stuff from scratch. 
Um, you can also use outside vendors to conduct independent audits and testing, which is a little bit more expensive, but you also could, will catch things that maybe you wouldn't catch because you give yourself the benefit of the doubt <laughs> and an outside auditor might not do that. Um, you need to have people in your company who understand the ethical issues around AI because those could be as damaging as actual data security issues. Um, and you might want to work with outside parties or industry or nonprofit organizations about being a good ethical citizen when it comes to AI and ML projects, because this is an area of regulation. This is an area of public interest, and you want to be on the right side of history for that. Um, uh, we talked about uh, making sure that the AI vendors that you're using for your AI and ML systems have uh, sound systems, um, have good training data, they don't have bias built into them, um, and those other uh, things we talked about earlier. Um, and you want to establish a policies or a board to cover governance, ethics, bias, and, and security issues around um, AI and ML data and systems. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Maria. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure all of our viewers appreciate it too. I think there's some really great tips and takeaways here for perhaps any AI and ML projects that may be going on in, in your organization right now, or especially, especially your future AI and ML projects. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. It's been great talking to you. And thank you all so much for watching. We hope you enjoy and please feel free to check out the rest of our offerings for even more about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Thanks again.